Hi guys, it is great to be with you on your Business Link conference. I was thrilled to be invited by Chris and Lloyd and facilitated by Michelle. I think on behalf of Mike and uh, the leaders of Relational Mission. And it is such a joy to participate together, to partner together in this way. And I'm praying that I will be a blessing to you, a strengthening of the purposes that God has given you. Uh, as you may have uh, received links or, or heard, uh, I've done a couple of short clips on a few subjects around this topic. Uh, one is called God's Design for Money. Why money? What was God's purpose in that? And then four little building blocks around that concept of God's design for money, looking at the king, uh, the place of Jesus when it comes to money, uh, the call, how we have a generic call as God's people and specific calls and how to find that. Thirdly, the commodity, the actual good or service that we're dealing with. And lastly, the calendar, how we balance all these different aspects in our lives and, and where the marketplace and finance fits into that. So those may be of use to you, but I'm going to confine the topic today to the marketplace and mission and take a look in the next five or six minutes at some theological issues that I think are important for us to grasp and then look at some examples of how marketplace and mission have lived out in my life, which I hope will set up for some Q&A later. And lastly, some do's and don'ts for um, church leaders and business leaders, marketplace leaders and uh, church staff leaders, how, how they can do more of the right thing and less of the wrong thing. So here we go. Father, thank you so much for these moments. Thank you for the gospel potential there is of this Gospel Link conference. I pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven that you would come mightily in these moments we have together for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are uh, three theological issues that I think are important to embrace around this topic of the marketplace and mission. The first is that God sees work as good, not neutral, uh, certainly not a necessary evil, but as good, as an expression of who he is, part of original creation before the fall. Uh, we can see that in, in the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning time, God created work, space, that's, uh, uh, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, matter, and his spirit was hovering over the deep energy. In those first verses, time, space, matter, and energy with work done that caused change. God created the heavens and the earth. Time began, space began, matter began, energy began. And from there, God continued to work. Let there be light. And there was light. Let the sea teem with creatures. And so work very much part of original creation. And we know from the scripture where God placed Adam in the garden uh, again before the fall and says, uh, verse 15, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of this and gave him instructions, etc., about his work. And uh, it's nice to have the wind blowing. It means the rain is coming. Uh, the scripture is very clear. Jesus saying, my father has been at work and continues to be at work. Work is an expression of who God is in himself. Secondly, work is blessing. God sees work as blessing. And when he created man in his image in Genesis 1, 26, and created man male and female, created them, the next verses say he blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, take dominion. He gave man mandate. He gave man work. He put man in a context of function that would later be denominated in money and come to be known as the marketplace. Generating food, purchasing food, dealing with 
goods and services. And then the third theological thing so important to grasp is that God sees work as worship. And not only as good, not only as blessing, but also as worship. That work itself reveals our heart, reveals our character. And where Jesus says, where your money is, there your heart will be. Also, the, the link there is work. We work and generate income. And that very often will reveal or demonstrate our motivation. And so with work, it's not only what we do that is worship, but why we do it, the motivation of our heart, how we do it, the character of what we are doing that honors God. And uh, Colossians 3 is so excellent on this. Uh, Paul saying to the church in Colossus, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then later on, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So God sees the work that we're doing as essentially for him in its righteousness. And through the fall, that gets perverted and we end up working or serving the wrong person or the wrong thing. I don't know if you remember that Bob Dylan song, uh, you've got to serve somebody, got to serve somebody. I'll try and send it on a link. You may be the president, you may be a peasant, but you've got to serve somebody. The, the reality is that we are working for someone or something. And uh, in Christ, the purpose of God is that all that we do is unto the Lord and for his glory, it is to be worship. We see that lived out in Adam's life, the mandate that he was given right there to represent God on earth. And then even through the fall, we see it in the lives of Cain and Abel, the sacrifice of Abel that was uh, acceptable to God, the pattern that God had given of the work, of the increase of the land to bring some of that grain. And for Cain, who farmed a different type of farming, livestock, he was to trade and bring God the grain offering, but he wanted to do it his own way. And so right at the foundation of creation, the very beginnings, uh, there is to be this trading and marketplace interaction of people. We see it certainly in the life of Joseph and how he honored God in his workplace. Not only what he did, but why he did it, the motivation of his heart and how he did it, his character. Deuteronomy, uh, the whole principle of the tithe and generosity to God's people was around honoring that it is God who gives you the ability to generate wealth and uh, money and the marketplace. Our work actually reveals where our confidence is, where our trust is, where our hope is. And uh, finally, in this work is worship. Jesus himself modeled work, modeled what it is to honor God in the marketplace, to produce a product on time, at standard, without wastage, to sell it at a profit in a way that is a blessing to those that receive it and a blessing to those that have provided it. The marketplace in action around Jesus Christ himself. And one of the most beautiful examples of this is Ephesians chapter 4. It's actually seeing work as a proclamation of the gospel. This is again Paul writing to the church in Ephesus this time, verse 28 of chapter 4. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And you can just imagine Jesus so fulfilling that in its entirety, that he worked honestly with his own hands and did that in a way that was profitable. It was of benefit and value to those around him as well as himself, and that he was able to be generous on every occasion. Work is good. Work is blessing. Work is worship. And so uh, as we move off these foundational theological aspects, really to embrace that God sees work this way 
as a fundamental part of his kingdom, as a fundamental part of the advance of his kingdom, that uh, both rest and work are godly and good and worship and are to be in the right place in submission to who Jesus Christ is and his lordship. So seeing the marketplace as integral to God's mission, I would love to give you three examples of where I've had the joy of being involved in this. Uh, the first in Zimbabwe, the second in Mozambique, and the third in across the region, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. In Zimbabwe, it would be Imtech Sales, which is a company that I took over the management from, uh, from my father and eventually bought him and his partner out. We represented Massey Ferguson Ford, Fiat tractor spare parts in Zimbabwe under a, a British distributor called Sparex. And we also represented a ball and roller bearing company called NTN and later on NSK and a little bit of FAG and competed with SKF if you know them. On the bearing side, we were in the mining, agriculture and industry sectors and uh, with the tractor spares, primarily agriculture, but also a little bit of mining. And uh, the profits from Imtech sales, uh, I used to tithe as net profit before tax. And I would do that on a monthly basis, straight off my management income statement, 10% straight to the church. And I remember at the time, PJ and I were part of River of Life. Uh, I had the joy of tithing, letting go of that money entirely. And whatever the eldership discussed and decided is what, it, what happened. And we bought properties and built buildings and planted churches and did all kinds of things. It was a tremendous joy. Uh, secondly, I found I provided for my family and saw that as such a uh, blessing from God and mandate of God's through the marketplace. And thirdly, the provision of services to farmers, to miners, to industrialists enabled their businesses to thrive. And being able to provide that, as Brian Aldrieff taught me, on time, at standard, without wastage, yielded profit. On time, at standard, without wastage, really generating value for everybody in the market chain. And so uh, Imtech sales, uh, that, those would be the, the top three things that I saw as the kingdom expression. Uh, finance going into the church, uh, family being provided for, and other families and entities being blessed through the provision of goods and services. Uh, an example in Mozambique is Eggs for Africa. Um, uh, Imtech Sales is still operational in Zimbabwe, but I felt called by God to set up another business in the north of Mozambique as we started planting churches there. I've always felt called by God to provide my salary as long as he gives me grace to do that from my business involvement and not to draw it from my eldering responsibility in a local church or apostling responsibility in the sphere. It's just a personal calling element. And so Eggs for Africa began and uh, that's really had two primary blessings. We haven't made money over the last 12 years. And in fact, just to be in business, having invested half a million dollars into an egg business in Mozambique, just to be alive and still going is a huge blessing. And I'm amazed at God's provision. I expected to have made a lot of money, but we haven't. But what has happened is it has platformed the involvement of other kingdom advancing initiatives. Uh, church leaders being able to be on the ground, employed or involved with us and able to plant and strengthen churches. People in school, we've been able to start a junior school and a senior school because of the involvement in business there that has given a way in for that. And so the business has been a platform for church planting, school establishment, health initiatives, uh, education and in other education initiatives, and I think it's only just the beginning. The other blessing that's come through Eggs for Africa is that the protein intake of those around us has gone up. And northern Mozambique, as you may know, is one of the poorest areas in the world. Mozambique, one of the lowest four uh, countries' GDP in the world. And northern Mozambique shares only 20% of the resources of the country with 80% of its population. So the poverty is extreme. And just to have the number of eggs up, the availability of chicken up, 
has been a great blessing. And I think the business model we're coming with, which I don't have time to get into now, but this special chicken called Sasso, which everybody can grow with zero feed cost, uh, free ranging them, is going to take protein consumption more and more into that area. The other blessing that we've seen in Eggs for Africa is crocodiles. And uh, we've been able to take a waste product of the mortalities of the birds and uh, our next door neighbor that does broilers taking the abattoir waste and feeding that as waste into crocodiles and turning the waste into a luxury product through the skin, the pelt of the uh, beast itself. So that goes to Italy uh, for the, the um, bag and um, belt market and into Texas for the boots. It's belt bag and boot market. The best is Italy and, and second. What can't get that standard goes to Texas. So that has been a, an expression in its own way of wisdom of God. Uh, we used to fight with people over the waste product because people were desperate to eat the, the um, chickens that had died and etc. and put it into something of value that's actually a blessing to the government. Lastly, Africa Alive. This is now working across regions and it's taking poultry uh, as broiler birds and seeing the church as the channel for blessing into the community, aiming for 18 to 28 year olds and bringing a business model that is synergizing a sphere, Disciple Nations, a business, Sondalani Ranching, and a foundation, World Poultry Foundation, together. Within that, there is a for-profit motive, there's not-for-profit motive, uh, which is the foundation, and there is apostolic motive, just purely wanting to see young men and women able to step out and go and plant and strengthen churches. And just coordinating that and seeing it take off in the initiative called Arise Zambia in Zambia, Africa Alive in Zimbabwe, and Disblokiandu Potentialidades de Mozambique, DPM in Mozambique, unblocking potential has been a tremendous thing. And that's really about uh, three objectives, communicating Christ, generating profit, and demonstrating character in the areas of money, sex, and power. And so seeing business and the marketplace as an integrated part of this mission to raise the next generation in a way that the proclamation of the gospel can be known uh, in a sustainable, self-sustainable way and bringing through the character for generations beyond to benefit from. So as we close, three do's and uh, two don'ts. Do's, preachers, uh, church leaders, do affirm the identity of God's people in the world as well as in the building. Affirm the identity of God's people as the church in the world as well as the church in the building. For example, as you go today from Sunday, God bless you. You are the church in the world. You are the church everywhere you go. Be the salt, be the light, be the body of Christ everywhere you go. At home, on the tube, in, in mountain climbing, abseiling, whatever you're doing, you are the church, you are Christ's body. Affirming that and celebrating individuals uh, where there may be individuals or entities that do particularly good things, profiling that on Sunday's affirmation. Secondly, engagement. Visit the marketplace, uh, places of work of your people. Uh, engage with them, identify with them, understand them, pray for them, discuss with them, dream with them, network with them. Wherever possible, identify with the marketplaces that are represented in the church and see where the synergies can come. See how you can be a blessing to them. And then thirdly, collaborate. Gather together giftings. Having affirmed publicly and then identified in the places of work, it's such a great platform to gather together, a bit like this may be today, Business Link. And I think one of the exciting things there is inputting, uh, building faith in them, letting, creating context where they can dream, explore, and envisage. And also share vision. Draw them into where the sphere is going or where the church is going and partner together on how can we be more effective? How can we unlock resources? How can we invest time, talents and treasures together 
in a way that propels this mission. And then lastly, two, do less ofs or don'ts. Firstly, don't ignore the marketplace in your preaching. Jesus didn't. I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but I think it's crazy. The number of times he refers to the marketplace and money, I, I think it's more often than he refers to heaven and hell combined. So the marketplace is a place of worship. It's a place that reveals character. It should be in our preaching, in our application, earthed for people. If we ignore it, we kind of give the sense that church is for the really spiritual moments and then there's the rest of your lives, which is secondary. And then lastly, on do less of, do less of only thinking that marketplace people are useful in the church for what they can give financially. Uh, involve everyone as much as possible in all levels of church. Wherever possible, have marketplace elders in the eldership. Uh, wherever possible, have people in life groups and in all the structures and involvement of the church, worship teams, etc. And uh, uh, there are contexts in the world that are very strong on church staff, and they will need to be very intentional about integrating marketplace leaders. Marketplace leaders, conversely, need to be really attentive to growing their relationship with Jesus, being led by the Spirit and not of the flesh, trusting in God, not their money. And that's so important for guys and girls, men and women who are strong financially, strong entrepreneurially, to be humble and submissive. And as they do give of their money, not to try and control the church by what they give, but trusting God, just like they trust God with their time and their talents in a church, to trust God with their treasures as well. So I hope that gives you some thoughts on some of the theological issues to really embrace some of the ways that's worked practically that I've been involved with directly and some thoughts on do's and don'ts. I look forward to Q&As and I hope you guys have a tremendous Business Link conference as we link the marketplace and the mission of God in a dynamic way and fulfill the purposes that he's had right from creation. God bless you.